So, but now I'd like to move on to the not so friendly volcanoes, the red volcanoes. This is Mount St. Helens in 1980, and uh, these are very explosive volcanoes. So, they have the greatest risk for humans. They often produce pyroclastic flows. Pyro is fire in Greek, and clastic is broken, broken by fire. So there is no continuous flow of lava. What happens is that the material breaks up from gas expansion, and that produces ash and other particles. And um, these can form glowing avalanches, blasts and surges, as we often call them. And these, of course, have huge uh, destruction potential. The volcanoes in Japan, in Indonesia, in the Caribbean, in the Northwest American uh, Cordillera, and in the Andes are of this type. And um, the different types of volcanic eruptions show very different hazard potential. So this is why also we have a lot of fatalities in the southern hemisphere where many of those volcanic systems are. They contrast the friendly dark volcanoes that we talked about just before. So I'm showing this image once more. Now we're going to focus on the three types of eruptions in the left part of that uh, illustration. And uh, we're going to look at Pelean eruptions, Volcanian eruptions, and Plinian eruptions. How does it actually work? Well, you all have this experience. You have a fizzy drink, and the fizzy drink is in a bottle of, well, in a closed bottle or in a can. And um, if you shake it a little bit and you open it up, it sprays out. And why does it spray out? Well, it's because there's gas dissolved in the liquid. And once the liquid is under pressure, the gas stays in the liquid. There is no problem. As soon as you decompress it by opening the bottle or the can, the gas will start to expand. And that drives the liquid out, and it actually fragments the liquid. You get a spraying effect. And that's what happens with magma as well. And that produces tiny little particles, pyroclastic particles, as we call it. And that is, for example, what then erupts as ash and other types of materials. So it's effectively um, uh, an overpressured soda can that you may want to think of inside a volcano. Once you take the lid off, it will spray out quite violently. So the first phenomenon I'd like to talk about here is ash fall deposits. And here we have this Plinian eruption, a column of ash and hot gases rising up into the air. And it may go several kilometers high. And then it might spread out when it reached a certain level of buoyancy. And then the winds might also carry it away. So for at Mount St. Helens, for example, there was total darkness within 360 kilometers of the volcano at the time during the eruption, because the density of the cloud is so intense that light doesn't come through anymore. The associated ash fall caused, of course, a lot of destruction. Agricultural lands was affected. And if the chemistry of the ash is not very good, then it's a poisonous effect. Basaltic material is usually quite good for agriculture, but the red volcanoes have higher silica, and it's usually not so good for agriculture. So here, we then have dry volcanic ash, but if there's rainfall on top of it, the volcanic ash actually turns into a slurry or into a cement-type material, and that's extra harmful. So let me give you a few impressions here. Here, a few images from the uh, situation in, back in 1980 at Mount St. Helens. And here you see the cars in the lower left. This is not snow, this is volcanic ash. And what looks like a snowstorm in the top right is actually volcanic ash being blown around. And volcanic ash is not good for you if you breathe it in, because the tiny little particles, they will stick in the lungs. You will never get them out again, and it can cause silicosis. So uh, the particle density in those situations is so high that you can only really work there with a mask. And back in the 80s, nobody really told anyone about that. 
so nowadays we know a lot more. So um, it's not very healthy to be in those situations and ash fall has severe consequences. So here's a few more impressions of ash clouds back from Mount St. Helens in 1980. And uh, this gentleman here, he was smart enough to put a mask on. But as I said, if we have then ash mixing with water, it becomes like a, like a cement or a concrete. And uh, here we have that letterbox there being, uh, well, partly engulfed by this slurry and the car driving there. Well, it creates an ash cloud in itself. And uh, this means very high particle density in the air, very bad for humans and animals, of course. So here's the ash cloud from Mount St. Helens, and uh, this is the travel speed of the ash cloud. And as you see, it actually traveled almost a thousand kilometers. And uh, at 9.15 in the morning, it was about 50 kilometers away from Mount St. Helens. And by end of that day, uh, at 18.15 in the evening, it had traveled something like a thousand uh, uh, kilometers to Idaho Falls. And uh, is of course a wind factor here. If the wind comes in one direction, it well blows it in that specific direction. If the wind goes another way, if the wind would have come from the other side, it would have blown out onto the ocean and would have been far less devastating for humans and animals in the area. So luck is of course, the weather in this case is of course also a factor that always comes in. So <clears throat> the other thing we see at these volcanoes is pyroclastic flows. And here's a pyroclastic flow from Merapi volcano in Indonesia. And uh, then in the top right image there, there is a pyroclastic uh, flow deposit from Augustine volcano in Alaska. And uh, this is hot ash clouds that rush with enormous speed down the hillside. They're usually valley hugging. They usually uh, follow low ground and uh, they would travel in ravines, for example, but they can be up to 600 degrees hot, and they travel with up to 500 kilometers per hour. There is no escape if this is coming towards you, and that makes them very, very dangerous. So here's one of the very first pyroclastic flows ever observed from Montagna Pelé in 1902. This was after the disaster of Montagna Pelé in 1902. The French scientists, they came there and they were puzzled what happened to the city. They had no idea. And then later in that particular summer, 1902, another one of those ash clouds came down the hill and Lacroix, he made that photograph. And this was one of the first realizations for modern science that this is a phenomenon. Prior to that, we really had no idea. And then we have Punetubo 1991, for example, and my understanding is that this car did not make it. So I've mentioned the eruption on uh, 1902 from uh, Montagna Pelé in, um, in Martinique in the Antilles. And uh, well, Saint Pierre, the city, it was believed to be, or it had the reputation of being the Pearl of the Lesser Antilles. It was the local capital, it was beautiful. And uh, there was an election coming up and uh, the, well, the political elite was very keen to not evacuate the city to make sure that the election would go through. There was good signs we would recognize today as being very dangerous. There was good signs the eruption was imminent, but uh, the authorities did not evacuate the city. In contrast, they invited all the refugees from the villages into the city. And what happened then uh, was that a huge ash cloud traveled down at several hundred kilometers of speed with temperatures probably over 800 degrees C, and it devastated the city. So on the left here in the bottom, you have a photo just in the days before the eruption with all the ships in the harbor. And then on the right-hand side, not a single house survived in Saint-Pierre, and 30,000 people died. And later in the summer, Lacroix took that picture, and that explained what actually happened, that such a ash, hot ash cloud was traveling very rapidly down from the volcano through the city and killed all the people. So here's a few impressions from uh, Montagna Pelé eruption 1902. There was a lot of warning signals. The wife of the American ambassador actually writes in a letter home that the conditions were terrible. Horses are collapsing in the streets because of the sulfurous smells and the ash. 
but that was not enough to evacuate the city at the time. So it led to this catastrophe. And worse yet, as you probably know, Martinique produces a lot of rum. And after the hot ash cloud went through the city, all the rum distilleries were starting to burn. And rivers of burning rum have been reported at the time. So it sounds a bit crazy, doesn't it? But obviously there was no preparations for a volcanic eruption at the time. Often these are the kind of very tough lessons that help us to improve things enormously. And of course, today we have a very functional volcano observatory on the island that is manned 24 hours a day, 24 seven, and uh, it checks exactly what the volcano is doing. So Mount St. Helens, this is something that has also been a bit of a surprise at the time and therefore an amazing lesson for volcano researchers. So what happened here was, here's a time sequence, it's only minutes here. We have the volcano bulging out initially and then the volcano actually collapsed. And we talked about large landslides here in the Canaries and actually Mount St. Helens had such a landslide. And the landslides uncorked the volcano. In the central image, you can really see the flank of the volcano moving, and then the eruption started, not the other way around. So there was, if you will, an uncorking effect by gravitational sliding of the volcanic material, and then the big eruption happened. And this was the big eruption cloud in Mount St. Helens that has been recorded, and it killed several of the volcano observers that were stationed there. And uh, two of the heroes of volcanology are these two gentlemen there, Truman and Johnson. And one was stationed two and a half kilometers, the other one four kilometers away from the volcano. And they, believe it or not, they actually buried their cameras underneath them. And we were able to retrieve the films in the camera. So they took images until it was just about too late and then they turned around. So once people realized what these gentlemen actually did it was really recording for science until the very last second possible. So, and here is the trees um, surrounding um, Mount St. Helens. And actually, it looks like a big devastated forest, but still there is use for volcanologists because the direction in which the trees have fallen actually tells us how the clouds were traveling. So we can use that to map the progress of the ash cloud. So this is Mount St. Helens uh, today, and there's a new dome growing inside, and uh, there is a little, yeah, stippled line, and it tells you, it shows you the size of the volcano prior to the collapse, and of course, all of that material is missing. It's been blown into shreds, and that was causing the big eruption and devastation around Mount St. Helens. Another effect there at Mount St. Helens was not only the direct eruption, there was another thing, and that is mud flows. And here on this specialist map, we don't need to go into details, but there you see in dark colors in black the debris envelope from the ash and pyroclastic cloud, but then you also see along the rivers that it says mud flows. And this is another problem because they happen to come a little bit later after the eruptions. All the ash is lying around and then it rains, and then you have slurries of ash-rich mud, and it travels down the rivers. It's basically like concrete flowing down the rivers. So there's a new dome growing inside the crater of Mount St. Helens, and this is uh, from an image from 2006 when I happened to have a chance to look at it. And uh, this is now pushing up, and it's a little bigger now, actually, and it's still growing. So sooner or later, in geological time, Mount St. Helens will fill its peak up again. So let me bring you to Indonesia now, and uh, this is where the death toll of volcanoes is a lot higher. And I mentioned Merapi volcano earlier. Merapi volcano is called a killer volcano for good reason. It killed about 1,500 people in the last few hundred years, and it's almost permanently active. It has a few breaks every now and then, but it's continuously erupting and there's a lot of people living around the volcano. The city of Yogyakarta with four million people, three and a half to four million people, is only about 20 kilometers away from the volcano. So this is Merapi, and uh, there we have several 
uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site, like for the Borobudur uh, Buddhist Temple, the largest Buddhist temple in the world. And it was actually only rediscovered uh, about 150 years ago. It was buried under ash and lahars, mud flows in the jungle. And uh, the British colonial forces heard about it and they sent an expedition out there and they actually discovered it and now it has been reconstructed. And it sits at the foot of Mount Merapi. So uh, this volcano has quite a history. This is where I got involved uh, as a young researcher. I was able to join the efforts at the time in 2006, and this is the village of Kali Atem, only about 600, uh, six kilometers, 6,000 meters away from the peak. In the top right image, you can just about see the peak of Merapi in the background. The village was evacuated, but it didn't survive. Two volcanologists were stationed at the time in an observatory bunker, and uh, the bunker was buried. And these two gentlemen did not make it out. So uh, this is the dark side of volcanoes. These things are very, very severe. And this is now a volcano park. You can go there. The village has never been repopulated. So here's a few more impressions. And the image in the bottom uh, with a gentleman with a yellow t-shirt, that's the observatory bunker. And uh, this is where the two observatory staff found their last well. So. We have large eruptions of this type also in the Canaries, and um, this is a succession of large volcanic ash cloud deposits on Tenerife, in the south of Tenerife. Luckily, no such thing happened for about 200,000 years on Tenerife, but back in its heyday, in its early days, there was large eruptions. We see the thickness of these ash and pumice deposits. They're quite massive, and they would really wipe out everything in its way. And science is, of course, partly opportunistic. And uh, when you look at these deposits, you find all sorts of things in them, including fossils. So we found the skeleton of the giant canary rat in uh, um, these deposits. That's a species that's now extinct. And you can see some of these fossils in the museum in uh, Santa Cruz in Tenerife. And uh, yeah, so for science, it has been very useful, like Pompeii, in Italy has been very useful for understanding Roman life, but of course for the people or creatures involved, this is not a very nice end. <laughs>